folks. Very sad day. This is our second to last class together. You know, I know you're all super sad. Um, they know these things of you again. Who knows? Uh, okay, so very quickly, uh, homework. You probably should have got the emails uh, and see on the website that homework four was released. Uh, if you haven't, go look at it and get started now. These are challenges that should challenge parts of things that we talk about in class, um, and sometimes they need time. You need time to think about these things. You need time, time to get stuck. Uh, so you can log in with your username. Your username and password are visible on the course submission website. Apparently, all my emails to everyone went into the ether. Like, I have no idea what happened to those. So uh, I sent out 120 emails, and they went somewhere. Uh, so, once you're on this lovely server, let's see, is there anything, is there anything? Um, you can check out, oh no, it's two. Okay, well. uh, so the scoreboard's too big for my massive font size. Uh, you can run score to see there are currently nine levels. Um, these are just ordered in alphabetic order. Uh, and you can see that is it at least one, I think one student, maybe two, ah, I can't tell with this, sorry, we have to, I don't know what that's doing. How do I decrease the font? Then? Make text smaller than whatever it was. So it's not super useful for that. No, I increased the font size, but doing command minus, oh, there we go. See, yeah, so two people already solved all the challenges, so everything is doable. Um, and you can, another good trick is to use the scoreboard to try to see which ones are easier than others, and that can give you some directions of where to start, what to do. Uh, so you want to break a level. They are under bar challenge. So it is the list of challenges. You'll see in each of these that the directory is owned by root and is the group just execute me if we ls this directory. We will see an executable in there called just ask execute me, which is set UID, set group ID. So this means when you run this executable, it's gonna run as the group just dash execute dash me. And the goal is to call the leak command, user local bin, which will, is a little wrapper application that will help add you to that group level. So when you do that, you'll know that you've actually broke the level. Um, oh, this test file is not supposed to be here, but whatever, you can't see it anyway, so. You just think that it's a mystery that I magically put in there. <laughs> um, you can't cap it hmm? You can't cap that file either. Permissions in exactly, you can't, I can't. <laughs> I actually don't know what's in there, so I don't want to cat it, maybe it's like a password or something. Um, better not to do that. Um, so, this is the idea. So every one of these uh, directories, tidy up, stolen data, secure this house, search, rot me, read secret, just execute me, groups, uh, basic overflow. So these are all the things. Some of them have source code. It's going to be fun to play around with it. Um, yeah. Any questions? Uh, no, it's due next Wednesday. I decided to give you guys extra time since it was late coming out. So it'll be due actually after the final, but I do have to get grades in. So there's not going to be any late assignment, lateness on this assignment. So we'll take the snapshot of the scoreboard at that moment in time, and that's everybody's grade on this assignment. Any other questions? So you want to turn to read me because like I, I think I said before, these are little puzzles, right? So I want to make sure that you can actually solve the puzzle. So the read me will describe how you broke each of the levels. All right, should be fun. This is a fun assignment, I think. Um, oh yeah, we have all these people on the server, that's good. All right. security, uh, mainly because it's one of my favorite topics. It's my, um, I guess technically it's the first thing I ever got paid to do 
professionally and write websites. So um, that's kind of a special place in my heart. So the web evolved. So this was the snapshot of the very first web browser. So the web as we know it uh, was created by Tim Berners-Lee, who was a um, he wasn't a research scientist, but he was working at CERN. Anybody know what CERN is or does? I know what it is. But it's more big. What do they do? What's their big thing? Large Hadron Collider. Yes, the LHC, the large like making up. whatever particles hit each other. I don't know what physicists do nowadays. Um, so they have an organization that um, manages and runs these huge projects. And these are projects that cost like billions and billions of dollars to make and run. And they had this interesting problem in, this is around 92, 93 time frame, where they uh, had researchers continually joining the projects and leaving and everything is in kind of a state of flux. And nobody really knew, well, who do I go to to talk to the person that's in charge of X, Y, and Z, nobody knew. So uh, Tim Berners-Lee had this vision of, well, wouldn't it be great if we kind of had this directory that would be updatable, but you could update it, you could have a home page, and we could have like a list of people, and you could link to other pages of other people. Um, so he started writing, anybody recognize this operating system? Anybody use this operating system? Oh, wow. What is it? It was not the Mac. It's not 3.1? No. It's not MS-DOS. It's not MS-DOS at all. Come on, MS-DOS doesn't have GUI. <laughs> if you do it wrong, I'll give you a hint, the name is on the, the name is in the picture. That it is. It's not universe. There's a lot of words on here. Somebody was close with Mac. So what did Steve Jobs do when he was ousted from Apple? <coughs> Yeah, so he started a competing company called Next. And you can see in the upper right here, this is the logo of the Next operating system, NEXT. So this was the Next OS that they were running. And Tim Berners-Lee had a Next uh, system, and that's when he coded the very first web client and web, brow uh, web server and web browser on. So this is a, um, this is a uh, picture of the World Wide Web. Uh, which is a hypermedia browser slash editor. So this is actually kind of interesting as he had it, um, this idea already in his head that he wanted you to be able to edit sites as well as just browse them, which we've kind of lost over time. And this is, has the um, distinction of being the very first website. So this was the first www um, website. Uh, and actually a fun fact is I played around with this www browser, and it actually still, I mean, if you run, you have to run next in a, in a uh, virtual machine, but you can still use it to browse the web. So it's, it still kind of works, which is ridiculous. Um, and so this is Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, he was knighted, which is pretty cool. And he had this first idea, so in, I guess I have my time frame a little bit wrong, in 89, and he has this great book. If you're interested in the history of the web, I highly, highly recommend this book, uh, Leaving the Web. It talks about the genesis of the web. And it's really crazy um, to think about that we went from, you know, he created this, essentially this really small thing just for CERN in like 1990. And by the end of the 90s, literally like a decade later, you have the dot com crash and the dot-com boom and all that stuff. So um, it's really insane to think about, like think about something that you design today being used by like millions and millions of people all over the world in less than a decade, which is pretty nuts. Um, so one of the nice things, so the, the key idea is that Tim Berners-Lee didn't invent all of these things. So he borrowed this concept of hypertext, which is essentially you can have a text and it's, it's actually very, you know, right now it's a very um, natural concept. You have some text, it, it links you, you click on it, and it takes you to somewhere else, right? Uh, this was a pretty revolutionary idea. I think it goes all the way back to like the 60s and 70s. Um, and there have been some attempts at systems to do this, but it's very difficult um, to actually do it. 
And he also had basically the internet. So he didn't invent the internet, he didn't invent TCP IP. But this is one of those things that's important to remember when people talk about the internet, they're not talking about the web, right? The web is just another protocol that runs on top of the TCP IP stack, but it now has the lion's share of almost everything there. Um, so the idea grew into how can you have universal access to a large universe of documents? So you can have one document, and there can be links on those pages that point you to other documents, and there's links on those pages that point you to other documents, thus creating this web, right? That's where the web part comes from. The idea, the problems that he had to solve and that have to be solved is how do you name a resource, right? If I say, oh, you should go check out this web page, how do I actually tell you the name of that? And then when you're on a web page, how do you know how to visit those other web pages that that page is linking to? So there's actually, it seems like a problem that is not a, like, what would you ever think naming things would be a problem? But if you're going to want to have everybody be able to name things and name documents in this universe, um, talking about the, the web as a universe, uh, it becomes a difficult problem. Then how do you request and serve a resource? So how do you actually do that? How do you, once you know who to go and who has this service, how can you actually make that request to get that service? And how to create hypertext. So how to actually have something that says, okay, if you want more information about this thing, go look at this other document. And it's really crazy to think about these three things form the core nexus of the, the web as we know it today. Um, so how to name a resource was solved with URIs or originally URLs, a uniform resource identifier. So this is how you name things, how you find things. HTTP was created as how you request and serve things. And HTML, the hypertext markup language, is how you actually create hypertext to view and display things. Any questions on these? So, and there are actually three, so this is actually one of the most challenging things about web security and web technology in general, is that if you were, let's say, if you want to be a, oh, I don't know, an embedded systems person, you just write C code that works in an embedded operating system, um, and that's kind of your life. Or if you want to be, develop, let's say, back-end Java applications at some company, you're just going to develop Java and whatever, you write interfaces, you write code. If you want to be a web developer, you have to master a huge list of technologies, the three core of which are URIs, uh, HTTP, and HTML. So to even get started in doing the web, you need to learn three different technologies, and then the list grows more and more as you get more and more advanced. Uh, but there are really interrelated. So the idea is a URI, which is just what we think of as a, um, I'll kind of use URI and URL interchangeably, um, which is what we think of as the HTTP colon slash slash google.com. Well, that is a URI. So once your browser has a URI, then it knows how to make an HTTP request to that server, google.com in this case, to ask for that document. And what does that server then reply back with? with an HTTP reply with HTML, right? And that HTML document inside of it, if it has links to other um, documents, will then contain further URIs, which our browser can turn into HTTP requests, which give us HTML responses. So it's this nice life cycle where you continually have these three technologies really interacting. Um, so the idea is you can think about a URI as metadata of how to find a resource. So it answers this question of how to name something. So like, I don't know, if I say, oh, get document X, Y, and Z on google.com, right? I could just tell you that and you would maybe have to translate it, but um, the URI is a nice standard that specifies how to do this. So basically, it answers which server has it, so who do I talk to, and when we think server, will then get translated to an IP address, so who has this document that I care about? How do I ask for it? So URIs, um, we usually think of them as HTTP. Has anybody seen any other types of URL links that don't have HTTP in the front? Yeah? FTP. FTP, 
Yeah, there's FTP links. What else? Anybody see any other one? Anybody use a mail to link? You can click on a link that automatically pops up your mail client. So that's a mail to URI. So this is the how do I ask? So this answers the question, do I talk HTTP to this server? Do I talk FTP? How do I actually talk to the server? Um, then how can the server locate the resource? So how does the server know how to find what I'm talking about? And again, these are all as we talk about a network, uh, when we talk about networks, everything here is defined in RFCs. So you can actually go look up the standards to know how, to, how do I parse a URI? And how do I get it to its constituent parts? Um, the basic idea is we have the scheme, a colon, the authority, a slash, a path, a question mark, a query, a hash, um, a pound symbol, and then a, the fragment. So the idea is the scheme is the protocol to use. So HTTP, HTTPS, that was another one we didn't talk about. FTP, mail to. The authority then would be the entity. So who, who do I talk to? Um, so it's usually a server name, and it'll usually be in the form of, is that somebody's alarm? Or is there a carbon monoxide leak? Um, so uh, it'll be usually, it'll be, if you've ever seen, usually you'll see host, the host name is google.com. Sometimes you'll see google.com colon a different port name. Uh, that tells the server, so there's a default port for each scheme, so HTTP is 80, FTP is 21, I want to say, is that right? And then uh, HTTPS is port 443, so there's default ports, but if you wanted to change that, you can add a colon after the host name uh, to put the port that you want to talk on. And then you can even specify usernames and passwords, there's all kinds of stuff, so. So path is usually what we think about in a file system. It's a hierarchical structure starting separated by slash. A query used to pass non-hierarchical data, data. The super interesting thing about this is that a fragment, so if you see a link with a fragment in the URI, that fragment actually does not get sent to the server. The server has nothing to do with that. It's actually for your browser when it displays the page to take you to what they call a subsection or sub-resource. Um, so it's, well, all right, we'll get into that later. So, um, but the key thing is, the path, the query, everything basically after the authority, the path and the query literally to you mean nothing. Because you don't really know how to interpret that resource. The only thing that knows how to interpret that is the authority. So google.com is the only one who can essentially know what resource you're talking about when you say slash foobar slash 12 and then a query string of whatever you want. Um, you can change it, obviously, so you control this, this URI, but fundamentally what it means is up to the server. Um, so some examples, so you can have, uh, this has a scheme of foo, authority of example.com on port 8042, path of slash over there, and then the query is test equals var, and it has a fragment. Uh, you can have an FTP, you can have a mail to me. How would uh, you parse this? So what's the scheme here? And what's the um, authority? Fundamentally, well, 
a you know, well-designed web application will generate URIs that whose paths correspond to routes in the application itself. So back to this question. So there's kind of we have a problem here, right? Because do we how do we parse this path? Is it slash test slash example colon one dot HTML? Uh, uh, what's this question mark? And then a slash, and that's the path. Or is the path test example dot com colon one dot HTML, and then everything <coughs> after this question mark is the is the query part, and the query is slash Adam. Uh, so this is why we need. To escape things. So we can already see in here, and again, this gets back to um, a issue that is all about parsing. So a lot of security problems are all about parsing. And so here, the question is, how do I parse this string into its constituent URI parts? Well, I have some ambiguity here because this URI is including some reserved characters. So how I interpret it may not be whoever created this URI. So we need some kind of encoding. So the idea is all of these characters are essentially special characters according to the URI. So we need just like when you have a string in C or Java and it's contained in double quotes, how do you actually include the character double quote in your string? You put a backslash before it. And then you have another problem. Well, how do you do a backslash? You have to put another backslash before it, right? <coughs> Uh, similarly with URIs, but instead of using backslashes, they use what's called percent encoding. So the idea is the spec says you have to include, encode anything that's not alphabetic, a digit, a dash, a dot, an underscore, or a tilde. And you percent encode it by using the percent symbol and then followed by the hexadecimal representation of the byte, which means that ampersand would be percent 26. And of course, we have the same problem. How do you do uh, how do you do the percent symbol? Well, it's actually pretty easy. It's percent twenty-five. Uh, a space character is ASCII, so it's hexadecimal representation of twenty, and so on and so forth. So we can actually fix this example, and depending on how we fix it, that will change how we actually parse it. So this would say, okay, the path is test example percent three a, which is actually the colon symbol. Uh, one dot HTML and then the query is slash Adam. So this is a completely valid URI now. Everyone will know how to parse this. The question is really if, if example.com knows what to do with this, who knows? Uh, but it's at least a valid URI that we can parse. Questions on URIs? Cool. All right, then we get to HTTP. Um, so the idea is HTTP is essentially a protocol for how a web client can request some resource from a web server. Um, it's based on TCP. So what guarantees does this mean that we have when we're using HTTP? Don't you guys have a midterm in a week? <laughs> I mean a final. All the data gets there. So when the server sees a request, it knows that it has all the bytes that the client actually sent. What else? Secure connection. Define secure connection. Uh, the three-way handshake. Like the client knows that it's talking to the server. The server knows it's talking to the client. Yes. So we've established. I wouldn't call it secure necessarily, but I'd say that there's a established connection. So we know that the client is not spoofing a request. We can be sure we have, or even then we know you can maybe spoof a request, but we know that we established a three-way handshake with an IP address. So we know we have that socket pair of source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port. Cool. Any other properties? Yes, well, the request will be in order, right? But the client will know um, that the server will know that all the bytes, and the client will know that all the bytes it set will be sent in order, and there won't be anything out of order messed up. Cool. So version one, so this was actually um, standardized in May of 1996. 
and it has had several revisions since then. Although you can see there's actually a, you know, a revision in 1999, and then version 2.0 is basically still under discussion and is not yet standardized. Um, this actually is going to be a very different style of protocol, uh, where it's all binary based and there's multiple streams and different things can happen, but um, it's still under discussion. So the idea is. As we've seen, we know with HTTP, so we know this is a TCP server, so we know the server must first listen to incoming TCP connections on whatever port it's listening on, that default port 80. So that's what the server has to do, it waits, 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 and the client opens a TCP connection to the server, doing the three-way handshake and everything that we talked about already, then sends that re the request, the HTTP request to the server, the server reads the request, so which will be in the HTTP request format, and sends an HTTP response back, possibly containing HTML content. Um, it could also send back whatever it wants. It could send back a PDF, an image, whatever the server wants to do. So graphically, the way I think about it, so you have the client, you have the server, HTTP request to the server, and HTTP response back to the client. Um, in reality, when you actually start developing web applications, things get much more complicated. Um, there may be a proxy, there may be a firewall from the client to the server, depending, like at ASU, you go through a, um, uh, a uh, how do I say that? Actually, I don't know that that's for certain that you're, definitely the incoming traffic is checked. Huh. Well, that'd be a good experiment to run. Anyways. Um, uh, so the firewall, so you may be talking about firewall, the server or any other node in between could actually be running a proxy which can um, cache. So oftentimes servers run with proxies in front of them so that the responses can be cached. So that way every request doesn't have to get to the server. And to make matters more complicated, your browser often will have a cache. So it will sometimes not request resources if it doesn't think it needs to. And so your request is actually going through the firewall, through the proxy, then to the server, and all the way back, um, making the situation very, very complicated. And this doesn't even go to, well, how does the server make the response? Maybe the server talks to a web application that talks to a memcache machine and SQL servers and all this stuff just to create an HTML response for you. Um, so when you break it down, an HTTP request is pretty simple. Uh, you have a, what they call a method, so some kind of what you want to happen to this object. You have the resource that you want, which is actually derived from the URI. The version of the protocol, why is including a version of a protocol useful? Parsing. What about parsing? So version can dictate how you parse the request? Yes, because different requests may require different things. What else? So you're designing a web protocol that you want to be used by millions and billions of people. Do you include a protocol number in the, in the request? So this is a way of doing that, of putting it in the protocol. 
And we saw this even with IP. So IP puts the protocol in there, the protocol version number. Uh, information about the client, so the client actually sends information about itself, and an optional body. So the server will sometimes send data to, uh, the client will sometimes send, send data to the server in its request. Uh, the syntax is pretty easy. So there's a start line followed by headers, followed by the body. And everything's separated by CRLF. So this is important um, because, as we saw, TCP is stream oriented. So all you know is you've got some bytes from, all the server knows is, hey, the client sent me 50 bytes. Is this all of the request? Is there going to be more to this request? Is there going to be less to this request? So, uh, so you have to have a way. You either can specify the size in advance of what you're going to send and say, I'm going to send you 500 bytes, and then you wait for 500 bytes. Um, or you can do it like this, where basically um, the headers are separated. So basically, every header is separated by a CRLF, which I believe is a slash R slash N. I don't know, that may be backwards, so I'll look that up. Um, and so the method, so anybody who's done web stuff, what are the common HTTP methods on an HTTP request? <laughs> Again, what was the other one? Patch. Put. Post. And delete. Put. Delete. Yeah, what are the differences between them? Just know that there are different ones. Yeah. Um, I think the major difference is that it applies to a lot of situations, which is the difference between get and post. Mm -hmm. Which and is get shows what the request is, which basically is a query, whereas post hides it. Not quite. Uh, so the difference is how the server. So in reality, the server can do whatever it wants to anything. It can serve them all the same. It can do completely random things depending on the method. Uh, you can even write custom methods that aren't defined in the spec. Uh, get is basically, hey, just give me whatever entity is referred to. So thinking about this in terms of documents, this means just give me that document. Uh, post basically is asking the server to do some processing with the data that you're sending. Put is usually uh, storing something, and head is identical to a get, but don't return me a body, which is kind of weird. But uh, the idea is, the core difference is that get, a get request should be item potent. So do we remember what that means? What? what does that mean? Item potent. I learned about it in the operating system. Right, so you should be able to make one get request or a hundred get requests, and the state of the server should remain the same. So fundamentally, it means a get request should not change the state of the server, uh, whereas a post request can change the state of the server. So this is when we think of things like when you sign into a web application, you should be making a post request because you're changing the state you are now signed in. When you log out, that should also be a post request. Um, and this actually got, I believe, it was Google in trouble. It must have been 2006 or 2007. They wanted to, they were creating, I think this like, it was like a plugin or something that would let you browse the web faster. And what it would do is it would see what page you were on and try to prefetch links that you were likely to click on from that page. So it would follow get requests on that page. And of course, not a lot of, not every website actually is very strict about following these things. So this would cause all kinds of havoc. It would like log people out of the application they were using while they were using it. They didn't understand why. And um, I think it'd probably like post like blank comments on social media sites, like all kinds of stupid stuff. Um, because this is not a very strict, but if you're doing stuff, you should be thinking about it like this. There's other ones, options, deletes, trace, connect and you can define arbitrary things. So if we look at an example, this is an incredibly simple example. So the stat line, or the start line, um, starts out with the method, so it says it's a get method. And this is actually something that's interesting uh, when we talk about the version number. So the version number is actually the very last thing of the stat line. 
So it's a get, a slash, and then HTTP slash 1.1. What does this mean when you upgrade to a new version of HTTP? What can you change and what can't you change? So this is all from the client, because this is the browser making this, right? 80. 80. So port 80. 
So it does I connects the IP address on port 80. So why does it send this header? Isn't the client already talking to www.google.com? Because they just made a DNS request and got back an IP address.
actually, it's a Chrome, but it's saying it's Mozilla 5.0 on a Macintosh. And actually, information is your user agent leaking to the server. Quite a bit, right? Google knows now that I was run I'm running a Mac. That not only am I running a Mac, but that it's an Intel Mac OS X 10.10.1, so the specific version number of Mac OS I'm running. Plus, it tells me the version of Apple WebKit that I'm running and the specific version of Chrome that I was running. Um, so you, all of this information, including your IP address, are all being leaked to Google. And not just Google, but every single website you ever visit. So that's fun. Uh, and definitely, when Tim Berners-Lee was creating this stuff, he, they were not thinking about this kind of a privacy angle. Um, so the server reads this response. It knows exactly what site you're talking about with the host field. It knows exactly how to do this. So it responds with a protocol version number, a status code, a reason for that status code, headers, and a body. And the nice thing is this protocol is pretty symmetric. So headers followed by CR, uh, CRLF. Um, and, but most of the time, the response will have a body. So uh, yes, uh, almost the same overall structure. And the idea is, again, with the body, how do you know when you've reached the end of the body? So either the server will specify a content length, content-length, which will tell uh, the client how much body to expect. Uh, the flip side is it's just essentially everything until I close the connection is the body. So in this way, you can have kind of, uh, you don't have to specify the length in advance. OK, so the response code, so this is where you get the classic 404. So basically, the response code is a three-digit code. The most significant digit tells you a little bit of something about it, so if it's a one, it's an informational, which you should almost never see. If it's a 200, that means, hey, this was a successful, you made, this was successful, so I received your request, I understood it, and I accept it. Uh, 300 levels are redirects, which is the server's way of saying, hey, that I understood your request, and that resource you want is somewhere else. Maybe somewhere else for me, maybe somewhere else completely. <coughs> a 400 means the client messed up, says like, hey, I don't know how to refill your request. So either your request itself was bad, or like a 404 would be, I have no idea what resource you're talking about. Go away. Um, a 500 means, oop, I messed up. Like, you sent a good request, but the server blew up. Maybe the server's run out of memory and it can't allocate any more memory to handle your request. Um, so normal ones you'll see are 200 with the risk the short message will be OK. Uh, here's some other interesting 200 level ones. Uh, 300 level ones, a 301 is like moved permanently, which means that the client can cache that response. And so it knows to actually never talk to the server again for that resource, to always go to the redirected resource. Um, 400, bad request. 401, unauthorized. Forbidden, not found. Server error, all kinds of fun stuff. So modern requests, so we saw the requests, and then the response actually is much more complicated that we get back from Google, where Google says, hey, so this is actually interesting. The, the response tells you exactly at the very start what protocol you're talking. So it says HTTP slash 1.1, uh, 200 is the status code, which means it's OK. That means everything here is headers. So there's all kinds of. Um, headers here, things to control caches that exist in any proxy servers along the way, and your browser's proxy server cache. Um, what, how should the client interpret these bytes that you're sending back in the body? So text HTML means, hey, this is HTML. You should be parsing this as HTML. And we have the actual content of the page here. Um, so since we talked about authentication, I thought it'd be interesting to look at HTTP itself actually has built-in authentication. Um, and it's based on a challenge response scheme. So going back for a second, so we see this is our response. So we're using TCP for this, right? So what is, so going back to the security here, what does this mean about the security of this data we just got back from the server? So, given 
imagine that we are talking from the client to the server on TCP port 80. What does this mean about the security of this response that the client just received from the server? It's not encrypted. It's not encrypted. So what does that mean practically? Yeah, everything's transmitted in plain text. So every single node on all those hops from the server to the client can see all this content. Anybody who's on the same network as us that's doing some ARP man the middle type nonsense could see that traffic. Um, anybody possibly, yeah. Uh, so it's not in, it's not private. So all of this is in the open. What else do we know? Or what else is the result of using TCP? It can be spoofed, or somebody could have injected fake content in there. So we actually don't know for a fact that what Google.com sent is what our browser actually received, right? So this is the problems with, um, so this is why we looked at and studied UDP and TCP security, is now when we look at a protocol like HTTP and we say, okay, this is built on TCP port 80, and we say, oh yeah, all those attacks we looked at for network security, all of these apply to the web. You can't trust any, you know, essentially anything you get back, anyone could have seen and anyone could have, mean, could have changed. Um, you have to consider your threat model to see how realistic those things are. Um, but fundamentally, that is what that means. So, when we look at authentication, so authentication is Something that we would, you know, is kind of natural to put into a protocol is how can a client authenticate itself to the server and so that, that way a server can have um, access control over resources, right? And say, okay, some documents are only for some users. Uh, and it's a simple challenge response scheme. So basically, the server sends a 401 message to say, hey, you're not authorized to view this. And so, the client then has to authenticate. So here, let's look at an example. So the client, the server replies with a 401 message, which has a www-authenticate header, which, and it tells it to use basic authentication and uses the realm of reserved docs. Then the client, so then the browser usually asks the user for the password, like, hey, or like a username password. It says, hey, um, uh, are you, you know, this website says you're not authorized, give me a username and password. And then the client will then try reaccessing this resource, specifying an authorization header, saying that it's using basic, basic authorization and a base64 encoded username and password. So is this secure? So can the server check that the person is authorized to view this file? passwords, it can authenticate the user by that username and password that's sent in this header, and then it checks its access control list to say, is this person authorized? Yes. What's the username and password here? Can you recover the username and password? Basic 64 encoding, 
you can actually just decode this and now you know their username and password. But you don't even have to use that. You could just steal this header, make your own request, and use this header, right? You don't even need to know that it's basically foreign code. If somebody else is on the same network, there's a possibility that they could play ARP spoofing games. I think that would depend on the specific Wi-Fi uh, device, if it would allow you, because a switch basically allows you to send ARP packets and replies to people. I think when I've tried to do this in wireless networks, most of them have won't forward that message to anyone else. Um, and, and because you're using a password protected Wi-Fi network. Well, I guess it is important that WEP is completely broken, WEP. Uh, so a WP network can be completely broken and cracked, but uh, other types are secure in the sense that you can't just listen to other people's traffic. Even if you know the password, you can't listen to other people's traffic. Cool. So you should never use this. And it sucks because it's built into browsers. So <laughs> You think about why does every website reinvent their own stupid username, password, form, and all that stuff? It's because the built-in things to HTTP suck. Yeah. Well, just about everything's moving away from HTTP anyway, right? I mean, there's a lot of SSL certificates that are now being put by. Yes. Uh, HTTPS, though, still uses HTTP underneath the hood. So, I mean, it's the only thing different is you create an SSL connection to the other server, but you're still talking HTTP. So you could use this over, um, as, over HTTPS, and it would, it would work, and you would have slightly better guarantees, but you still have this weirdness of you sending, like, um, and I mean, you can't, the other problem is the website can't control what the UI looks like for this username password prompt, so that's also pretty bad. So it fails like in UX, it fails in a lot of ways, yeah. Would a VPN fix this very much, or? No, a VPN only encrypts and hide your traffic from you to the VPN endpoint. But then anyone else who's on that network could be, that request to the server is all unencrypted. Um, so you basically are shifting your trust from your local network to that remote network. All right, HTTP 1.1 defined different, they were like, oh, this is completely broken, maybe we should not do this. Um, so basically the server sends a nonce as a challenge, so sends a random, digit, and then this client basically sends a request with a hash of the username, the password, the nonce value, the HTTP method, and the requested URL. Um, so essentially, so what, what this means is that once you've taken the hash of the username, password, the nonce, the method, and the URL, somebody else can't use that header value because the server would send them a different nonce. Right, so their hash would be completely different. But the problem here is that the web server actually has to have access to your clear text password. So the web server on its side has to be able to do this computation and be able to compare that things match. So it's actually why nobody uses these things um, because they're not really designed, which means, of course, if somebody breaks into your server, all the, the problems we've talked about, they can see those passwords. So. Um, cool, okay, so you can actually play with uh, HTTP traffic. As we talked about, you can use big TCP just sniffers. You can use <coughs> sniffers. Um, you can look at it from servers. Browsers are actually really good now at analyzing HTTP requests and responses. So if you enable development mode in your browser, there'll usually be a tab that has the network request, so you can actually see what HTTP requests the client is making, your browser, and what the server is responding with. Um, you can use proxies on either the client or the server side to see what requests are getting sent. Um, there are really cool things. So uh, Firefox has some stuff that actually allows you to alter and mess with uh, the headers that are getting sent. Uh, probably the best tool if you want to kind of delve into this further is Burp Proxy. So Burp Proxy is like a professional web pen testing tool, and it has a free version, so you can just download it and use it. Actually, that's what I use as the free version. Um, and basically, you set up your web browser to use Burp Proxy as your proxy, 
And so that means Burp can see all the requests that you're sending, and you can actually edit the requests in there. You can fuzz things a little bit. It has some crawling capabilities. It's really cool, and it's nice to be able to see exactly what's going on. All right, crash course in HTML. So we're doing all the basic tech today, so we can talk about vulnerabilities on Thursday. Um, so the idea is, okay, so HTML has a super long history. Um, and it started out it, as part of the web in 95. Anyways, there's been a lot of revisions. Um, something super interesting that I didn't realize until I studied this history was that XML actually came from HTML. Um, and it was an output of trying to standardize HTML because the original HTML is not very standard and nice. So then they tried to shoehorn HTML back into XML to create this weird XHTML hybrid uh, in 2000, but that completely failed. Like nobody used that. And so they abandoned that effort and were just like, okay, we'll keep HTML its own, not XML thing, and we'll just live with that. So we have, and HTML 5.0, it's reached this point where it's a um, they call it a living standard, where it's constantly being added to and updated over time. But you can go check out these standards to see exactly what HTML is. Um, the basic idea is we want to mark up our document with tags, which try to add meaning to raw text. So you've actually all had experience in writing in raw text. How did that feel? I know this is a callback to 13 weeks ago, but writing policies in an ASCII text file? Yeah. Terrible. Terrible, why? Editors make it doesn't look nice. Doesn't look nice, what else? Editors make life easier. Editors can make life easier. They can also make life more difficult, I would argue, if you're trying to do something fancy. Um, but yeah, so that, that idea is you have raw text, but maybe you know, maybe you wanted to bold some part of your report, or maybe you wanted to, I don't know, format it nicely or fully justify the text, right? You don't have that control over just raw text. And so the idea is, uh, so the markup language, the M in HTML, is you're trying to mark up your document with tags which add meaning. So the idea is, you have start tags, this is a ta uh, tag of foo, followed by some text, and then an end tag of square, oh, these aren't square. Uh, these are angle brackets, uh, slash foo. Uh, you can have a self-closing tag, which is equal to, which is just syntactic sugar over bar, a start bar and a close bar with no nothing in between. Um, and this is all 100% similar to XML, except for this last fact where you can have tags that have no end tag. So you can have image tags, other types of tags that have no corresponding close tag. Cool, so tags are hierarchical, so you, so this is kind of a basic HTML page. So you have uh, HTML tags that says, hey, this is an HTML document. You can have uh, head tags and a title in there, uh, whatever you want. So by changing that, you'll change the title that's on your tab or your uh, browser window. And then you can have a body, and this body content could have paragraphs in here, which can say something like, I am the example. So it's up to your browser to then interpret, parse this, and display this correctly to the user. And it's hierarchical in the sense that head and body, so you can think of it like a tree. Head and body are both children of HTML, and head has a child of title. Title has a child, which is just the text example, and so on and so forth. But just tags are not really expressive enough because I may want a title, uh, I may want an image tag, but how do I tell it what file to use as the image, right? Or if I include a hyperlink, how do I tell it where to actually go? So you can add attributes to tags, and attributes, it's actually really annoying, there's four different types of syntax. Um, this is the tag foo with attribute bar. This is at tag foo with attribute bar, which has the, val which has the value baz. Uh, and these are both equivalent. Uh, attribute, uh, tag of foo, attribute of bar with value baz. 
They're just ones included in single quotes, the other ones included in double quotes. Both are syntactically valid. Multiple attributes separated by spaces. So here's an example of using all three. So if you, I highly encourage you to do this on any web page that you like, right click on it, say view source, and look at the HTML source code. You'll see it comes with this kind of stuff. The key of HTML, putting the H in HTML hypertext, is the anchor tag is used to create a hyperlink, and the href attribute provides the URI to go to. And the text inside the anchor tag is the text that shows up that you're linking to. So this would be an anchor tag with an href attribute of http colon slash slash google.com example, and that would show up just like this. So it's a nice clickable link that we all know and love. So this is a standard HTML5 page. Um, what does it have interesting in here? Oh, it has this doc type uh, which tells the browser that it's HTML 5.0. Anyways, uh, we won't go into all that. So your browser is responsible for doing this. Um, this is on a Chrome browser doing this. The cool thing is you can have browsers of all different stripes and shapes. So this is, I believe, Lynx, L-Y-N-X, which is a command line based web browser. So you can actually use this to browse um, the web. Uh, there's another one called W3M that I, do I still use that? I guess occasionally, um, which I used to use for like documentation. So you could actually use this from inside Emacs. So I could run Emacs and have like my code here and then the documentation for the function I'm interested in on another uh, thing so I can never leave Emacs. Um, just like with URIs, we have the similar problem of so what are these, let's go back to this example, this example. What are the special characters here? What characters are special to parsing of HTML? Angle brackets, slashes, quotes, single quotes, all kinds of stuff. Um, so we need some way to, uh, to deal with that, so the uh, so we use character encoding, the idea, and it's actually really annoying that this is all different than URI percent encoding. So this is a completely different encoding, um, but it's fairly similar. So you start with an ampersand and you end with a, uh, a semicolon, and you can name things. So you can give it a predefined name. Uh, you don't give it a predefined name. There is a list of names, or you give the decimal number. So this is the decimal Unicode code points, you use ampersand hash, or you can get the hexadecimal numeric character code, ampersand hash x, and then the hexadecimal. Uh, this is the root of a significant number of vulnerabilities in the web. So, for, so just like in URIs and with slash encoding, you need some way to encode the character itself. So an ampersand would be ampersand amp, or in the other crazy, you know, there's four different ways to do this. Um, the E on my name, this is how you do that. Uh, there's all kinds. So the less than, either the less than symbol or you can think of the left angle bracket uh, is ampersand LT. And we know just what we talked about. This has to be encoded if you want to use this because how does the parser know if you're trying to start a new HTML tag or are you using a less than character? Right? If you want the text of angle bracket foo close angle bracket or left angle bracket right angle bracket, or are you trying to create a new tag in the HTML structure called foo? All right. Let's do one more thing and then I think we'll be good. All right, forms. So we've all used forms. Um, so basically, a form has an action. So Forms will look like, let's go to the example. The beautiful forms that we use, have, they have different inputs inside here that say uh, student, class, grade, whatever. Uh, and depending on the parameters of the form, it will make either a get or a post request to whatever's listed in action. And here, because there's no method, it will use a get request. And so it will put the values in this key value, student equals avenue pay, 
and class equals CSE 591 and grade equals A plus um, and submit equals submit. So these are all in there. Uh, and if we look at the actual, ah, so this would be a post request. So the difference between a post request is this does not get sent as part of the URI. It gets sent as the data that we send in the request. So it's just important to understand that the input to a web application are all the links on the page because links automatically create GET requests or any forms present on the page which can have GET or POST requests. Cool. And when we come back, we'll learn about web applications and how they can be vulnerable.